morning everyone uh, welcome today to uh, this beautiful day rainy as always uh, beautiful day but beautiful day in bergen uh, today's event of uh, masters week uh, hosted by center on law and social transform uh, is based on alida stigler's uh, master's thesis i am uh, gyokan shen a researcher at law transform as many of you already know, uh, Law Transform was founded in 2014 with a collaboration between Chris Mikkelsen Institute and uh, University of Bergen. Uh, here we have many uh, colleagues uh, researching uh, on different fields uh, such as law, psychology, political science, sociology, anthropology, uh, and economics. Um, one of these researcher is, researchers is Alida Stiegler. Today, um, her master thesis is entitled as the, um, uh, the dark side of combating terrorism. Uh, and the main question that she uh, treats in her thesis is uh, the terrorism as a pretext used by authoritarian governments to oppress uh, the dissidents and to manipulate, abuse, or even violate the uh, uh, main or basic principles of fundamental human rights. I think Alida's thesis is a uh, valuable contribution to uh, uh, to the debates uh, concerning the current state of affairs uh, of democracy in the world. Uh, and as of today, in the first quarter of 2021, uh, the world is ravaged by a global pandemic. And also, even before that, uh, all the world population uh, have been struggling with uh, worldwide uh, terrorism, organized crime, uh, either in different regions of the world or worldwide terrorism. So against this backdrop, the defenders of democracy uh, have been losing their battle uh, in their struggle against uh, the tyrants or autocrats. Uh, and that shifted the international balance and the advantage of uh, non-democratic actors. Incumbent leaders uh, are increasingly using different methods to oppress the uh, dissidents, civil society and political opponents. And the result is they harassed uh, democratic forces with long detentions in jails or heavy sentences or torture or even murder. So we may safely assume that uh, the democratic regression is a global phenomenon and not only fragile democracies or so-called developing states are facing this, but also decades or centuries old democracies, constitutional systems experiencing this democratic backsliding too. Uh, there's a, a problem here, a red flag maybe, current authoritarian regimes justify their oppressive, oppressive ways of government, not by openly denouncing the main principles of democracy and human rights, but they somehow uh, find their ways to sneak around these basic uh, principles, which are mostly provided by words in the constitutions or legal provisions of different uh, systems. A little bit of history here, as many of you may remember or even read, uh, the observers hailed the 90s as the, uh, as the champion of democracy, as the victory of democracy. And even some writers told it was the end of the history and the democracy was the only game in town. But after about more than 30 years today, the prospects for human rights or democracy are quite dim. And um, as one study of 2015 said, I directly quote here, the state of freedom has worsened in every part of the world. Examples are abundant, we can say, from Europe, uh, Hungary, Poland, and Turkey, and from Southern America, Brazil, and Venezuela, we may say. And also, uh, as a leader will treat today, uh, USA, uh, a, the cradle of written constitutionalism, also took its fair share from this uh, global trend. A leader today will treat some part of this issue uh, based on the example of the USA, and uh, let me introduce you here before giving the word to her to our participants, starting by Alida Stiegler. Alida Stiegler has her master's degree from uh, Edwards Lorand University in Budapest, uh, Hungary. Uh, she finished uh, nearly on the top 
uh, the second best with uh, uh, the best note summa cum laude, uh, five over four, uh, 4.92 over five, which is almost perfect. Uh, previously, she studied at the University of Bergen uh, here as a uh, exchange student. student. She is currently uh, an intern and my uh, desk neighbor at Law Transform here. Uh, as to our commentators, Jette Kristiansen is a member of the Parliament of Norway in 2010. Uh, since 2010, she studied political science also here at the University of Bergen. She has actively worked in the, the committees relevant to our topic today. Uh, from 2010 to 2017, she served as an active member of Constitutional Standing Committee of Constitutional Scrutiny and the Norwegian Parliament. And since 2017, she has been serving as a member of uh, Standing Committee on Foreign Affairs and Defense. Also, she is a member uh, of the Delegations for Relations uh, with the European Parliament. Our second uh, participant, commentator, uh, Hal Gareno, uh, has a doctoral degree in political science, and he is currently uh, employed at the Faculty of Law, University of Bergen. He is part of an inter interdisciplinary research project on the history of the Norwegian police, and also his dissertation, PhD dissertation, was on crisis coordination, focusing on how the police responded to the terrorist attacks of 2011. Reno was also a member of the evaluation committee set up by the police and uh, intelligence services to evaluate and assess their roles in the terrorist attack in Bauru in 2019. So I believe our uh, commentators have uh, many things to say on uh, what Alida will present. But first I give the uh, floor to Alida and uh, then we can go on to uh, further discussion. Uh, thank you, Gulkan, and thanks uh, everyone else at Low Transform and those uh, joining on uh, Zoom uh, as commentators for being here today or as uh, participants. So as uh, Gilkan was already mentioning, uh, the key question of my master thesis is how states uh, respond to the threat of uh, terrorism. And I dealt with the issue related to the prevention of terrorism, especially the dark side of uh, prevention, as seen how states themselves can become offending uh, parties mm -hmm. uh, in order to protect uh, themselves uh, and their citizens. So what I was basically saying is that um, in regard to a ter terrorist act, it's uh, not uh, only the terrorist act itself that can uh, violate human rights, but also the, the defending states by uh, exploiting their uh, executive, judicial or uh, coercive monopolies. So my uh, thesis uh, uh, comes together in two parts. Uh, the first part focuses on um, the concept of uh, terrorism and the question of uh, restriction of uh, human rights in the fight uh, against it. So now I would just like to quickly highlight some issues uh, that make it especially hard to fight uh, terrorism uh, in a legitimate way. So first of all, we have the problem of, uh, of a lack of uniform uh, universal definition, which clearly foresees a shortage of legal certainty and uh, predictability. Then uh, our next problem is that uh, we have different uh, foreign policy uh, stances on combating uh, terrorism. For example, we have the so-called uh, preventive self-defense uh, uh, combined with uh, the excessive use of military forces we can see in the US and what I will also talk uh, on later on. Uh, and then we also have the posterior defense that is uh, more accepted uh, on the international level but also re uh, relies heavily on uh, military forces uh, other than that we also have uh, civil reactions uh, or other uh, use of treaties conventions legal harmonization uh, the second uh, the next thing i want to mention is that uh, that makes it hard to fight terrorism in a legitimate way is the fear factor uh, citizens and states uh, fear this uh, helplessness unbalance uh, when it comes to terrorist threats, uh, either direct or perceived, which uh, makes them um, feel this need for excessive measures. 
And, um, and that is a very slippery slope that can very uh, easily and fast uh, lead to, uh, to a breach of rule of law um, that states uh, really have to look out for. Then we also have um, uh, bad examples or convincing uh, examples like the US uh, that might uh, lead other countries to, to imitate uh, their responses to certain threats. Um, then the next uh, issue that makes it hard to fight terrorism is that we have this um, imbalance of knowledge uh, between the sides. Uh, for us, it's really understand. Uh, they're really, really hard to understand the complex uh, nature of terrorism. But on the other hand, terrorists have a good uh, overview on uh, on the role of media and how democracies function, what kind of uh, legal restrictions we have to live with. Uh, and for them, it's also more uh, success, more easy to be successful uh, in their activities than for us on the defensive side. And uh, in this part, uh, what I want to um, highlight uh, finally is that um, we have uh, competing rights here, competing interests. Uh, we have this need for legality versus uh, the need for effectiveness. We want security, but we want to keep and respect fundamental rights. So basically what will happen in the fight against terrorism is that we will have to give up uh, or restrict some rights, but for it to be, um, uh, for 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 the for the measures to uh, to fit into a legitimate system, these uh, these measures will have to follow principles such as uh, we need them to be necessary. We need them uh, to be. Uh, uh, acceptable, appropriate, suitable for our needs. We need proportionality. We need uh, it to be non-discriminatory. And we also ideally need it to, for, for, the, for the measures to be gradual. But it's also hard because when it comes to threats like terrorism, states usually don't start with uh, the smallest measures. They, uh, they like to go the other way around, start with extreme powers and then uh, slowly ease up. Um, but what we have to keep in mind is that uh, all of these principles should be kept uh, in the fight against terrorism if we want to keep the values that uh, basically differentiate us morally from our opponents. And also I was, uh, one last thing is that um, I was saying that we have rights that can be restricted, but we also have absolute rights that can never be any question on the, on the prohibition of, uh, of restricting them. For example, one is torture. To, in today's democracies, it is without question, or it should be without question that uh, torture is not something that, uh, for example, torture is not something that can be used in the fight against terrorism or in any circumstances. Uh, but for example, what happened in the US is, and uh, what some uh, authors even talk about is that there are certain circumstances uh, where we have to save um, the life of individuals, where it might, uh, where it might be acceptable to, to use the torture. In the US, there are even those who say uh, that we should actually just uh, legalize torture because uh, uh, the state and the authorities will be just using it uh, in any ways. So um, it's an interesting uh, opinion <laughs> that I will uh, focus on a bit later on. But first, I want to talk a bit uh, about my uh, research method. And I also want to be honest with everyone here. So I'm going to admit that I had no uh, pre-acknowledged method. But uh, looking at it uh, now, I uh, basically conducted a qualitative text-based uh, analysis. Um, my thesis is mostly descriptive and uh, it mostly focuses on um, secondary literature and creating an extensive literature review digest on, on the Hungarian uh, law doctrine. Uh, in addition to that, I use some uh, primary literature when researching uh, the US uh, and the CIA. And uh, in that regard, I also heavily rely on um, the US Senate report on this topic and also the human rights watches roadmap to justice uh, case study and then the work of newspapers and uh, other official documentations that were leaked or otherwise made uh, available for the public and uh, now 
in the second part of my thesis and also in the second part of my presentation, what I want to talk about is that uh, how the US government and the CIA work together after 9-11 uh, uh, during America's uh, war on uh, terror. So just, um, yeah, just a short uh, background of, uh, of where we are now is that uh, we are after 9-11. Um, based on the data collected by the CIA, it is um, uh, perceived that uh, uh, it is uh, the Al-Qaeda terrorist organization and its leader, Osama bin Laden, who were behind the 9-11 attacks. So the Department of Defense and the CIA, CIA is um, assigned this task to find and punish them. And that is how uh, the development of this new high level uh, security system was launched. But most importantly, this is also how the real danger to a liberal democracy began by measures taken by a state to prevent future attacks. Um, I want, uh, yeah, I want, <laughs> yeah, I want to go into detail on how the Senate report uh, was made and the problems that uh, they faced uh, during uh, the investigation processes. But uh, what I found incredibly interesting and what also the Senate report focuses on, uh, in parts, is how all this began and what kind of legal reasonings and uh, documentation were used to allow for the CIA's uh, detention and uh, interrogation program. And uh, this leads us to the question of uh, memoranda, which are uh, written formal opinions of uh, organizations, movements, parties uh, on a certain topic. And in our case, these are also the documents that serve as a basis for the CIA's uh, uh, activity between 2002 and 2009. So the starting point of uh, the CIA's interrogation program was a secret memoranda signed by uh, President Bush on the 17th of September uh, 2001, so a few days after 9-11. Uh, after and in this uh, memo, he authorized the CIA to perform operations where they quote, capture and hold people who are a serious threat to the citizens and interests of the United States. The problem here is that this document lacks specification of a framework for the CIA's activity um, and also who they were expected to report uh, to on their activities. Um, I guess it's needless to say, but it caused much international concern, uh, just as uh, other memoranda that uh, followed. For example, there, um, there is a later memoranda from the 7th of uh, February 2002, which stated that the Geneva Convention, um, according to which prisoners must be treated humanly, did not apply to the Al-Qaeda and Taliban uh, members. And in addition to that, they also stated that uh, since uh, these prisoners uh, were kept in uh, Cuban uh, territory in, uh, in the prison on uh, Guantanamo Bay, the U of the Loas also doesn't apply to them. They cannot apply for uh, remedies before federal courts or in any kind of court. So basically what happened is that these prisoners who were perceived as terrorists or who posed this um, threat of terrorism, they were uh, kind of, uh, their, their legal st status was just taken away. Um, at least uh, partly until 2004, when, uh, when the American Supreme Court um, put an end to this rule and, and said that the United States is part of the Geneva Convention. So no matter where the, where the armed forces of the United States are stationed, uh, the use of the, uh, the, Amer the, the American law does apply to them and they have to follow it. So these were the war and military uh, related white papers that I and uh, memos that I wanted to mention. And uh, there are three more called the torture memos that uh, I want to uh, briefly talk about because these are the ones that um, that uh, created the basis for the CIA's uh, torture program. So these, uh, the torture memos, so these are three documents um, created and signed by the deputy um, attorney general, the attorney general, so basically the head of Ministry of Justice, 
uh, and um, it was also um, it included uh, communications uh, between them and the CIA and also uh, between them and the consul to the president. So the first of these documents uh, focused on um, uh, standards, standards of conducting uh, interrogation. Um, what it means is that they were looking at um, uh, techniques uh, that would not uh, be looked upon as torture. So, for example, what they did is that uh, they also looked at the European Court of Human Rights case law, and they were uh, picking um, uh, cases and treatments that were found only inhuman or degrading treatment by the European Court of Human Rights. And uh, so they were collecting these uh, recommendations of, uh, of interrogation tactics that would uh, not be considered torture. Um, the second um, uh, torture memo focuses on the first prisoner of the CIA, uh, Abu Zubaydah, who was uh, the perceived uh, preparator of 9-11. Uh, and um, they were shooting him, keeping him in, naked in minus degrees, uh, applying waterboarding. Um, and their question in the second memorandum was if uh, this uh, can be seen as torture and, uh, and what kind of argumentations could they use to defend themselves and to kind of fend off the blames if they come in regard to that. The third memo is also on a similar um, note. It's um, it's uh, supposedly initiated by the council to the president who wanted the legal opinion of the attorney general uh, on whether interrogation methods used on, uh, on the prisoners would be in violation, for example, of the UN uh, uh, Convention Against Torture or if it could be served as a basis for a process uh, in front of the International uh, Criminal Court. So these were um, the memorandums. I think from, um, from only these, without talking anything else, it's, uh, it's clear to see that um, the way states uh, or, uh, reply to uh, threats, um, and now what I'm talking about is the threat of terrorism, but also in other cases is that they expand their powers inwards and outwards. So lastly, what I just uh, want to mention as a closing is uh, what should be kept in mind uh, when, um, when we fight uh, against terrorism in, in the future. So what I think is really important is to not just want to eliminate the terrorist cells, but to understand the nature of terrorism and eliminate the roots that they grew out from. Um, it is also important, of course, to detect and bring uh, preparators to justice. But for that, we also need police and intelligence services that are well prepared, adequately funded and structured. Um, we also need to define the base, the means, the motives and purpose for which the measures are done on. And it's also essential that uh, the measures taken, they have to be, uh, they, they, there has to be the possibility for, uh, for reviewal, for, uh, for remedies, and there needs to be increased control over those bodies who combat terrorism. But most importantly, and this is my final note, is uh, I think it should be, uh, should be highlighted that uh, the values that the terrorists want to destroy, those are the ones that we increasingly have to protect and uh, reinforce. And um, basically the point of this uh, thesis is also to, to kind of uh, say that we cannot move to this dark side of terrorism. We, we cannot um, uh, fundamentally violate human rights uh, just uh, so we feel this uh, kind of safety and security. Yeah, I think um, for now, that was me. That may be, yeah. That may be the end of your presentation. Thank you very much, Alida, for this excellent presentation. And um, what I can gather from her presentation is very concerning. Fear or comes the, the normative assumptions of uh, fundamental human rights and uh, against, particularly against the complex nature of terrorism. Uh, actually, this an old debate, you know, how to uh, restrict the freedoms vis-a-vis uh, -vis the public security and, and 
particularly European Court of Human Rights offers uh, ample uh, jurisprudence and guidance within this respect. And the, the restriction should be legal, legally, uh, leg, should have a legal base, should be proportionate and should uh, be necessary in a democratic society. However, uh, the case of torture is exempt from all these discussions. No reason whatsoever can uh, legitimize torture in whatever form. So there's no discussion about this, but I think in the US case, the uh, concerning thing is there is a normative argument that people or politicians use to legitimize torture. It's not about making torture uh, against in the, in, the, in the back room or uh, out of sight, but it is, uh, there are legitimizing, legitimizing arguments that want to, that attempt to shift the torture. Uh, this is very, 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 very worrisome and concerning. And also, uh, Hungarian uh, doctrine as a digest, uh, Alida has a very valuable contribution. I think she wrote in Hungarian, but if one day, if she wants to translate uh, her work into English, I will be the first one to read it because I'm really, really interested in Hungarian case as one of the most authoritarian states in European Union at the moment. So uh, that would be very interesting to know what Hungarian legal doctrine have a say about it. So I would like to give the word to uh, Yette first. Uh, each presenters, each commentators, I think I can give 10 minutes for the uh, beginning, uh, and then we can recap and continue further debate. Yette, the scene is yours. Thank you very much. And thank you for a great presentation. I am uh, looking forward to uh, once being able to read your uh, thesis in English. Uh, thank you very much. It's an important work. And not only, but especially since you are uh, Hungarian and, and, uh, and that you are writing about the Hungarian issue also. Thank you very much um, for your contribution for us to be more able to understand how and uh, why politicians fail in their fight against terrorism. Uh, this is in many cases a story with two crooks. On the one side, you have the terrorists, and on the other side, you have illiberal politicians. Uh, I will speak, uh, I have a few comments about both <laughs> crooks, uh, but uh, uh, first, just a short comment on what, uh, on uh, terrorism. Terrorism is a method, not an ideology. Uh, it can be used as a method under any religion, un under any flag, under any color, under any country. Uh, terrorism does not uh, see boundaries, um, which means the fight against terror is a global fight. Uh, I will come back to that. Uh, but when it comes to uh, the other crook, the illiberal politicians, uh, I think the, um, the start of uh, your presentation is very interesting because um, uh, you were talking a bit about democratic backsliding as an introduction. And I think that's a very interesting place to start because I am not the very big fan of the expression democratic backsliding. Because sliding away from democracy is not something that just happens. You don't just slide away from democracy. Uh, you ju don't just suddenly violate human rights on your fight against terrorism. That is something that you as a politician are totally aware of what you're doing and is a wanted course uh, away from democracy and away from human rights. This is not just something that occurs. Um, this is something that someone uh, holding power wants to occur. occur. Um, so um, what, um, how, do we, how do we recognize these kinds of politicians? I think it's very important to have it bear in mind, Timothy Snyder's uh, good punchline. He has a punchline machine, uh, but he has a good punchline saying that people that say you have to choose between safety and freedom are usually in the business of taking away both. Uh, and I think that's a very good uh, um, guideline to uh, when you uh, look for what kind of politicians you are, you are um, you are um, facing. Um, because there is fighting terrorism, that is one task. But on the other side, you have 
fighting human rights under the flag of fighting terrorism. That is two totally different things. So the fight against terrorism is its own discussion. But these politicians that you are mentioning and uh, that we are uh, coming into, they are not in the business of really fighting terrorism. What they are fighting is freedom of their own population so that they can pursue power. I don't say that that is just as dangerous as uh, terrorism, but I say they are related. Uh, and the problem with that kind of politicians is that it's not terror, it's not military coups. We as other European politicians don't have a clear sign on when to react. Because in these cases it is under which human right violation, under which um, um, uh, violation of uh, common international law should we react. It's very easy to react on uh, terror and it's easy to react on a military coup because then you have a clear second of, uh, of obvious reaction. Uh, so what is the legitimate way of fighting terrorism? If you are in the business of actually fighting terrorism, <laughs> you don't, uh, I don't think that you have to, to choose between that and holding uh, or caring about human rights. I don't think that is two different stories. But if you are in the business of fighting terrorism, you have to make um, your way of fighting terrorism a legitimate way. So what is the legitimate way? Uh, I think for a country to be successful in fighting terrorism, except from what uh, uh, you're uh, last slide said about knowing what the, uh, where terror comes from, uh, preventing it. Uh, I think you as a country, uh, you need to find the terrorists. That is very important. And I think it is possible to find terrorists without taking away the human rights of, the of all the other people in the country who are not terrorists. Um, because this is the same logic uh, of uh, that you of course know very very well from uh, from uh, uh, hung uh, Hungary or Poland or or any other uh, country that are having uh, politicians uh, running the country who are not uh, um, holding the human rights uh, issue as high as anywhere else and that is um, for example um, taking away the freedom of speech uh, under the flag of uh, fighting fake news. It is a very big difference between fake news and bad news. And of course, I do understand that illiberal politicians want, want to ban bad news. <laughs> that would be great <laughs> uh, for any politicians to do. Uh, but uh, it's, it's kind of the same dynamics. So uh, if, uh, you see, if you think that it is legitimate to uh, have instruments in a society to find terrorists, that means that you have to say uh, that it is legitimate to have secret services. And in a country that has uh, secret services, uh, they uh, need uh, to fight for their own legitimacy. The people need to, to really feel and understand and uh, look upon the secret services work as something that the secret services do for the common good. This work is impossible to do if there is reason to believe that the secret services is not working for the common good. That's why uh, their work has to be uh, transparent. They have to have, um, um, looking for the word in English now, please be patient. Uh, they have to have, um, uh, we as politicians need to decide their methods uh, and uh, we need to go back to be able to control if they are using their methods right. Only then you will have a um, legitimate way of fighting terrorism when the terrorists exist. But uh, a successful society would, will always urge for um, preventing people from becoming terrorists. And that is the biggest task. So I think I'll stop there and uh, looking forward to the discussion later. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jette. I really uh, totally agree with uh, your assumption that terrorism is a method and not an ideology and may take many forms. Uh, 
as it is the case for illiberal systems, it's not an ideology. It may take many forms and it can use many discourses and rhetoric to, to uh, legitimize their uh, course of action. Also, you pointed to uh, what we call autocratic legalism these days, using legitimate discourse and tools to legitimate the illegitimate. Uh, and this is also one of the things that has been brewing and your insights from politics, real politics, very has been very helpful today. So I would like to give the word to Helge, uh, who is second but not least. Please, Helge, the scene is yours. Thank you, uh, and thanks for the invitation, and uh, thanks for um, raising a very important uh, topic. Um, uh, I think this is a very important uh, topic, and also the, your perspective is perhaps sometimes um, forgotten in a sense, um, sort of the, the negative side effects of combating terrorism and how states use this as an opportunity to, to pursue their own interests. And I think it's a very, very important issue. And, and actually also indirectly, I think, more knowledge on this topic might also um, reduce the, the, the recruit potential for uh, terrorist organizations, which I may come back to. Um, and uh, I will try to be as structured as uh, yet there was in our comments, but uh, I'm not sure I will manage, but uh, I, I have uh, some some remarks and uh, some points to, to the presentation. So, um, first of all, I think it's uh, as you mentioned, just overall uh, or very broadly, it's uh, important to to uh, acknowledge that this is about dilemmas and trade-offs uh, in a sense. How to, how to fight terrorism? Um, there's no. Um, clear-cut answer and, and it's this, this um, how to sort of find the terrorists in a legitimate way without violating human rights as yet uh, alluded to in, in the end of her comments. Uh, and, and you were mentioning in, in your presentation uh, one of the challenges of uh, combating terrorism was this uh, fear factor uh, that you mentioned. And, and I was uh, thinking then uh, another point or aspect of that is evaluations and investigations of terrorist attacks. They tend to, not always, but they tend to, I think, um, also um, build, uh, build under this uh, fear factor by, by giving the reader the impression that um that it was quite possible to stop the terrorists by making the narrative uh, prior to the attack uh, a story about missed uh, signals uh, missed cues which in in hindsight you know it's very easy to 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 detect the the signals that they should have spotted uh, but in in present it can be very difficult and for uh, as a concrete example is the the report uh, 9 9-11 report which was uh, which has been a popular read and and it's very fascinating read as well but they spend a lot of time on on uh, presenting the story prior to the attacks of, of the, their planning in Afghanistan, how they came to the US and so on and so forth. And so I think uh, evaluations should be more, um, how to say it, more um, sort of framing it more as a sort of uh, the challenges, right? That, that, that there's not, not making a narrative of uh, one linear history because uh, this, this might also uh, raise our expectations to what the intelligence services uh, uh, should be able to manage. Uh, so I think this is a valid point. Uh, another point you were talking about um, competing interests. Um, and 
uh, I'm not an expert on, on the issue of um, radicalization, which is a quite new research field, but uh, what I know is that um, there is, so far, it's a lot of uncertainty on what are uh, the most effective measures to combat or to, to prevent people getting radicalized. So, um, and there's also, uh, now this makes it very hard for the politicians to, to uh, sort of agree on what are the most valid measures. Uh, and it also might uh, fuel this um, uh, polarized debate on, on how to combat uh, radicalization because, uh, because of the lack of knowledge, then, then you know, the people with perhaps not the best uh, motives can, can to some extent and with some uh, truth say, you know, uh, raise their arguments and not be confronted by, by uh, research-based uh, counter arguments. So this is also a challenge. Um, and, and also um, another challenge is uh, this, um, that the actors combating terrorism uh, uh, maybe are based on different logics or logics of action, uh, as we, we call it from my field. So we have the security field uh, with their motives and they are dependent on, for instance, uh, schools, uh, the health sector, uh, and so on, and getting information from these uh, more soft-oriented actors to, to detect who are the vulnerable uh, people and, and potential uh, targets for uh, terrorist organizations. And, and this is also, of course, um, a big challenge. Um, Let's see. Yeah, another thing I just thought about uh, after Jette's comment about uh, this, um, this other as aspect about uh, political uh, liberals. Uh, was that the word you used? Or this? Illiber illiberal. Illiberal, yeah, exactly. Uh, and this uh, concept of backsliding, which you, you didn't like. And, and I think that is a very good point, actually, uh, which I, I totally agree on uh, that uh, this this doesn't happen without anyone acting and and uh, i'm not an expert on the history of this but uh, i think both uh, in the case of hitler in germany and and turkey now with Erdogan and poland and hungary they they i don't think they at least hitler and in turkey i don't think they never had uh, the majority in an election initially, but they they sort of used the combination of terror and threats and, and sort of pushing their their um, powers uh, to enforce more uh, to making the executive branch more powerful. Uh, but please correct me if I'm wrong. But but the point here is then of course the importance of checks and balances. Uh, that you both uh, alluded to, both in terms of the executive powers, but all, also, of course, the um, intelligence service. It's very, very important that these are subject to, to control. And uh, just finally, maybe, then it's also uh, can be uh, a good point to make that, of course, we, we in Norway, uh, generally are very proud of our system and, and we, we brag about uh, high trust in the public institutions. But in 2015, um, the, we won, uh, or the Supreme Court in Norway was uh, won this award uh, in, uh, from uh, Columbia University for the best Supreme Court verdict of the year, which was uh, about uh, the intelligence service who had um, taken some uh, film material from uh, the director Ulrich Kirolsen, who was making a documentary about uh, radical Islamists. And they actually 
uh, went into his home and took some of his film material and arguing that they had the legal or legitimate right to do so. And what uh, I find worrying is that both in the, the district court and the court of appeal, they actually, the verdict was uh, gave support to the, um, or ruled in favor of the intelligence service. So it was only first in the Supreme Court that they that they failed and and Ulrich Rolfsen uh, won the case. So so we have uh, challenges here in Norway as well. Yes, thank you. Yes, thank you very much, Alge. Just a quick note about Turkey, uh, as you mentioned, uh, Erdogan had uh, initially had a, a very uh, robust electoral. Uh, support not the absolute majority of the society, but uh, at least a simple so uh, majority. Uh, and then, uh, with the help of the uh, caveats in, in electoral system, he became the majority in the parliament. And then, still today, uh, it is sad to observe that uh, he has his supporters in the majority, at least in the bare majority. And the Turkish society is very much polarized between anti and pro uh, government. Uh, stances, which is worrying that despite all these human rights abuses, there is uh, there is a public support, and not in Turkey, but I think in uh, in other parts of the world, and this is also worrying. Um, and thank you for also bringing up this dilemma uh, between terrorism and human rights. And both of you have mentioned that it is more important to uh, to to obstruct the terrorism happening before. Uh, everything. So the, the pr main problem is how can we re stop radicalization in the society and polarization in the society by using uh, less politicized methods. So I think this is the, one of the most important things that I gather from what you say. Um, I would like to ask you follow-up questions both of to you, but also first I would like to start with uh, Alida. I just want to know more about this this debate about this torture, which is very uh, unspeakable. We are, I'm really uncomfortable to pointing up to this, but there's this ticking bomb, classical ticking bomb de debate, uh, which points to the dilemma. Have you treated in this? Um, yeah, I, I can talk about that. And then I think I would also like to comment a bit on- uh, yeah. so <laughs> If you like, you can start really... commenting by, yeah, we, yeah. for, uh, for and yes. Yeah, it's just, uh, it was so many interesting comments, but I think that what you said with uh, democratic backsliding and how it's just not something that happens from one day to the other, but they do want us to believe that. So, for example, what uh, what the U.S. did, for example, um, uh, no one called it torture. Everyone called it uh, enhanced uh, interrogation. Uh, also, for example, what was really interesting for me to see is that everyone is talking about uh, efficiency when it comes to torture. Uh, even the Senate report, because yeah, Hage, you also also mentioned the Senate report, but uh, also the the making of the report was that um, uh, people tried to destroy evidence. Um, the things that came to life were basically things that were already known, and most part of it uh, is still. Uh, uh, still closed from the public, but also just that they were also using this uh, efficiency. The Sen Senate report said that torture is not efficient, and that's why is that why we shouldn't use it. Uh, and also the other thing that uh, I think it was you, Yetta, who said it that um, um, that uh, that that if the people uh, accept it, or we we should uh, come with uh, come with measures that are acceptable for the society. But for example, what happened in the U.S. was is that um, um, they. There was this really interesting uh, survey, and it showed that Americans felt the most proud uh, in 2017 of their country when they think about what was done after 9-11, more proud than about uh, moon landing or Obama elections or, or whatever. And half of them, like in the recent years, they still uh, accept torture, um, which yeah. I think is very... Um, there's another yeah. example in Philippines, 90% of approval of president's uh, illegal killings of, uh, in the name of a fight against drug. 90% so of the society approves these uh, inhuman treatments. I think this is a phenomenon also. Yeah, yeah and it's basically what, what, uh, what, uh, what, we, what we've been discussing. It's, it's because of this uh, fear 
that is also yeah. also 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 used in this rhetorics and it doesn't have to be terrorism it can be the fear of migration it can be fair, the fear of covid so actually i think i would also i don't know maybe I'll look into it more but but um but i think it's really interesting and disturbing how basically these external threats and they don't even have to be direct they just have to be perceived or they have to be presented as perceived threats and then how they they enable and open up this box that uh, that uh, politicians can use uh, to further their own political agendas and then they use these uh, arguments afterwards either like talking to the public and saying that it's uh, enhanced interrogation or even changing documents and creating all these legal argumentations that uh, even within the law uh, what we were is, is legal because the law says that and you do do all these uh, over interpretations of uh, yeah those uh, prisoners were actually uh, unlawful combatants, so we don't apply the Geneva Conventions. It's just for for me, it was really interesting how these legal reasonings were also used to um, to to kind of further their uh, agendas and their interpretations. And uh, as for uh, what you were saying about um, torture, their their dilemma was about the tickling bomb. Uh, what they said is that torture will be used and we should just uh, accept that. Uh, it's like it was Dershowitz who was Can talking you just about explain the, a little US. Bit the tickling bomb thing. Yeah, so basically, um, you have uh, you 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 have a bomb and you want to deactivate it and you have a terrorist and you are sure that he is the or she or she is the only means to deactivate that bomb and to say let's say save one five hundred thousands of lives. So, so what do you do? And uh, what they say is that in this case, uh, or what he says is that there are two ways. You can either uh, legalize torture and put in uh, put in uh, guarantees that would. Uh, I don't even know how to imagine that, but that, very, that, yeah. that that would make it uh, uh, secure, the least harmful. For yeah. me, honestly, I just I think I don't. That, yeah, and. Um, and the other option, what he says, is that otherwise it will be just used behind closed doors. Mm -hmm. And also what has been said, uh, what other authors said, for example, is that uh, if it was one person and let's say it's my child and OK, I'm going to beat this uh, terrorist so I can uh, save my kidnapped daughter or something, uh, I will do it. And uh, they will say that um, it's at least in Hungary, it wouldn't even be a crime because uh, I was fighting for someone's life. So then you can uh, fight with the same measures. But uh, then what some are saying is that if you give this power to individuals, then you kind of, but you don't give this power to the state, then you just make people want to take this uh, justice into their own hands. Yeah, well, this is, uh, this is a very... Uh highly uh, discussed argument and it, we don't have much time to go into this, but I can see that it's quite a manipulative way of uh, shifting the norms against torture. What do you say about this? Oh, yeah, there was just one more thing that I think is yeah. really important. And I think it was Hagel who was pointing it out that uh, radicalization is how do you measure it? We don't have, we also don't have clear clear definitions, but we mm -hmm. don't have clear measures. Uh, yet I mentioned this, who, who wants us to choose between uh, security and uh, and uh, and rights uh, is a good indicator, but uh, but uh, yeah, I also feel is that sometimes they just use these soft tools, these soft uh, argumentations, these covers. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, what I experienced from Hungary is that they also use the, these uh, rhetorics and propaganda very cleverly to, mm -hmm. to kind of cover what they are doing. And um, and uh, so, so I think we are also lacking these uh, these measures to to also uh, see when, when when politicians using uh, their powers, and also it's um, it's uh, also with ha I, I agree with both with Hagen and yet that uh, like uh, empowering uh, uh, the police and the investigation is is actually one of the most important parts because those that's the, the most effective way to, to combat terrorists, to be able to find them, but also how we find them. And then on the other hand, of course, I totally agree that the society has to be able to talk openly about, mm -hmm. uh, about this problem and how can we get ahead of uh, like radicals growing out of our own lands and doing what we know they are doing or yeah. they can do.
So since we're running out of time, I just want to also add, yeah, sorry. <laughs> yeah, add sorry. series uh, comment and question. Then I can leave the ground for one minute each for uh, both of you. And she finds very interesting your uh, presentation. She asks uh, whether you have found some uh, incidents or, 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 or indications in the US politics retrospectively uh, that this was coming, that this uh, anti-democratic stance and normative shift was coming in the discussions of Senate or- Like uh, before 9-11? Yeah, uh, right after 9-11. Oh, in the problem, no, no, before 9-11, yes. She asked before 9-11, even before 9-11, then these debates and did you have I mean, any I did to... not look at it, but uh, they were readily coming with uh, their ideas. So, these neoconservative yeah, ideas. Uh, so I, I did not look at it, but I would say that uh, it could be the case. Yeah. Like, uh, like how they started um, a few days after, right after with this war on terror and having all these clear, okay, not a few days after, but like having all these clear ideas uh -huh. that uh, we have to start this war. Yeah. Um, I would say that it's... Um, yeah, it was even used as a pretext, yeah, I say. Um, yeah. Uh, okay, yet there. Uh, you have any uh, further comments? Uh, absolutely. This is so interesting. I wish we had the whole day. And uh, thank you so much again for your um, um, remarks now. Uh, first, uh, one comment to Helge um, about uh, having an elect electorate, even, uh, even though you are an, a liberal politician. That is very possible. Um, Anne Applebaum writes in her uh, last book uh, that any uh, person who are democrat can uh, vote for uh, can vote for an uh, undemocratic politician under given circumstances uh, the problem with these given circumstances is that they are very possible for a politician in power to create uh, if you don't have a crisis or if you don't have anything external that people fear you um, politicians have the possibility to create fear, to create um, a division between people, uh, and to create a feeling of crisis, and that uh, and create the feeling uh, that they are the only one who can lead the nation through this crisis. That is a very popular way for uh, aspiring autocrats to win a democratic elections. And then after they have won, they have to secure that they don't lose it again. So then the erosion of uh, uh, checks and balances and the democratic institutions that put them into power uh, starts, but that is a di different discussion. Um, the problem with, the biggest problem with terrorism is that it is very effective. It works. It makes people scared of each other, of politicians uh, and uh, across boundaries. Um, that's why crises are perfect for uh, autocrats. Uh, but one last remark, I know that we have now only one minute left. If human rights does not apply for terrorists, they don't mean anything. Human rights do not mm -hmm. come with uh, conditions. Yes. Thank you so much for a very interesting hour. I wish we had the whole day. Thank you. So Helge? Yes, uh, I agree. Very interesting, and uh, but I'll be brief and just make two short points, um, additional points here. Uh, regarding the fear factor, I think the media has a very important role here, which we haven't talked about. Uh, and they, there are many examples of them giving much to, as a way more attention uh, to these incidents than than. Uh, there is actually uh, um, then it would be objectively or it, it's not re representative uh, so this really increases the, the fear in people and the other point um, I just want to sort of nuance the, the, the interpretation of at least my point about police combating terrorism because I I think, of course, police and, and intelligence service have an important role, but but they are not. Uh, more importantly, is the um, the civil sector, the schools, us as civilians. You know, uh, the police they take out the fire, but not the roots, uh, mm -hmm. the underlying causes. Yeah. So, so I think that's the main actor to combat terrorism is 
is uh, us as a society and uh, the civil sector, not the police. Uh, that's the uh, worrying uh, direction to take, I think. Yeah. Thank you very much. I, uh, well, I, I agree, both of you. And I also took my lesson about this uh, catchphrase, democratic backsliding. So um, that will be uh, very useful for my also for my own research. And uh, Alida, you have, I give you the last word too for a recap, if you wish. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. Yeah. So actually, I think what uh, what all of us were talking about, and what I think is also really important, is to kind of fight these uh, uh, fight against this uh, this communication that we see, and uh, fight against the misinformation, and to kind of uh, uh, fight against this uh, fear that. Uh, uh, that uh, is, is created uh, in us, so also um, uh, overblown by the media, and to just not readily give up our, uh, our human rights and to not just uh, accept uh, any restrictions just because we fear for our security and because we believe uh, that, it's, uh, that it's a great threat, uh, threat uh, to, to, to our life now. So I think we should we should do a question and uh, treasure our rights that we fought uh, long for and uh, and uh, not readily let them uh, let anyone restrict mm -hmm. them. Yeah, that's great. Thank you very much, and thank you for all the participants for their beautiful comments. And uh, I think uh, that's a wrap. We can call it now uh, the day. And thank you very much for listening to us. Have a nice day. <laughs>